Long time to see everybody. Uh, so I am thrilled to be here on this panel about, um, it was sort of presented as free expression versus safe spaces, particularly in universe, university settings. Um, but I imagine we will meander wider than that given uh, the other conversations that have happened today. Um, but that's sort of where we're gonna start. And just to begin with, I would love for all of you to very briefly introduce yourselves and also sort of where you're coming from on this issue. Um, try to keep it under two minutes. I don't really have a watch, but I'm gonna pretend like I do. <laughs> so let's just go left to right. So, Miriam. Oh. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I'm Mariam Namazi. I am the spokesperson of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, One Law for All, uh, FITNA, which is a movement for women's liberation. Um, I'm an activist on women's rights, secularism, and of course against Islam and Islamism, and as a result, Freedom of expression is extremely important for me. I think it's not a Western value. I think it's a universal one. I don't think it's a luxury. And I think for a lot of people, it is a matter of life and death. It's the only thing many of us have in order to resist and challenge Islamism and Islam. And so for me, I think uh, I'm, I'm very much a pro-free expression advocate. I think there should be very little reasons for why we limit free expression. For me, my line is, if there's an advocation, ad advocating of violence, that shouldn't be permitted. But otherwise, all forms of speech, even hate speech, should be allowed. And the best way to challenge that is by better speech, rather than censorship and uh, um, you know, um, shutting down conversations and debates and speech, which I think are hugely important. Um, there we go, it wasn't on. I'm Melanie Brewster, I'm a professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. And my area of work is predominantly on minority stress, so how issues like sexism, heterosexism, racism, uh, systemic oppression and dehumanization and marginalization, how this impacts mental health for members of marginalized communities. Um, I think one of the reasons that I was chosen to be on this panel is because I'm kind of from the, the microaggression birthplace. So one of my colleagues and professional mentors is actually Dr. Daryl Wing Su, who's kind of the founder of modern microaggression theory. So it's something that um, I feel is important. It's something that I can talk a lot about. And I do think that words can impact mental health. So I think when we talk about free speech, we also have to acknowledge that words can have power even though free speech itself, I think, is important to protect, too. So I'm probably going to bring a kind of balance in some ways to that. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Hader. I work with uh, the ex-Muslims of North America. We're a group uh, supporting apostates uh, around the United States and Canada. We build communities where they can find support. Uh, and help each other through the specific struggles that apostates go through. And uh, to give you my perspective, uh, I am uh, very disturbed uh, to, about the, the extent to which feelings have become uh, an argument and they've become a way to shut down uh, the debate. And this is, from an apostate perspective, this is often something that harms us and shuts us down because there are religious people who are quite offended. Um, about the things that we have to say. They feel unsafe because of the things that we have to say about uh, the religion and what it does to, to women and to minorities. So I think that this is um, a really important issue and um, I'm a little bit disturbed with the way that things have been going in college campuses. Um, hello, hi, my name is um, Diane Burkholder and I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, spent most of my life in California and partially in South Dakota, so just kind of understand my perspective of coming into this. And I've been in and out of academia throughout my career, working on college campuses, helping out with co college conferences. But also, um, I'm a community organizer in Kansas City, um, involved in uh, groups that work with mixed race folks, um, non-believers of color, um, also the movement for black lives. So I come into this conversation about thinking about the ways in which safe spaces play out, not only in universities, because that's also like we're going to talk about like you know, we're talking about access right that is a elitist space but the ways this plays out within our larger society um, and just for an example <clears throat> the reason um, 
you know, I came into this to talk about um, the intersectionality within safe spaces, but for me, and particularly in the work I do in centering blackness and talking about anti-blackness um, and how that can play out amongst many communities, even other people of color, um, I came into this conference um, yesterday and was like, great, this is a great space, women's space, but you know, I think this has been acknowledged that there's not many women of color here, right? And so how do we even make this more accessible to women of color or even women that don't speak the academic lingo? And so for me, I came in and I was like, this is great. You know, I saw Debbie's intro and I was like, I need blackness. And so I went over to DC and the National African American Museum is opening this weekend and I needed, particularly this last week with the killing of black men um, across this country and the uprising going on in Charlotte, I needed to fulfill myself to feel safe in order to be ready to enter this space and talk about you know, these really tough conversations. So I think we're talking about doing this work, what it means um, to not only center our own experiences but also talk about that we are uh, complete human beings um, and that feelings and emotions and also you know logic and reason all that matters that we can't just say one or the other well, thank you all very much um, I think uh, where I want to start with this is with the idea of safe spaces because I think the definition of what a safe space is is not always clear mm -hmm. to people um, and so we need an, to operationalize that that language, especially if we're talking about how it conflicts or does not conflict with the freedom of expression. And so what I would like to hear from you all is what, what do you think of as a, a safe space? And my understanding is that it is, it is not necessarily that all spaces need to be safe, but a specific space that you go to that you're among people who are not going to basically introduce trauma to your life. Um, and uh, we saw Soraya had uh, that great star, right, of spaces, often are safe spaces for white men all the time. So are we talking about safe spaces for people who aren't white men? What does that look like? How does that manifest? Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I, could, I could jump in. I mean, I think for me, when we're talking about safe spaces, it's to um, center the experiences of marginalized communities. So if we we're talking about particularly in the context of the U.S. and mo a lot of the world, we're talking about white, cis, heterosexual men, right, and also of a certain age. And so when we're looking at safe spaces, what does it mean for those communities that have to operate in this white supremacist country, this white supremacist society, in order to feel like, to have, to um, get back some of the power that is told and shown to us time and time again that we cannot have and we are not even seen as viable human beings. And so for me, you know, I really appreciate the conversation about talking about um, safe spaces online. And, you know, people are like, oh, they're just words, let them go bye-bye, right? Like, you're just being sensitive, that has a very real impact. And when you're in a marginalized community, particularly pr 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 folks of color and black folks, we show, the studies have shown that stress in and of itself kills us. Right, and so just seeing these words and letting them you know, bounce off our back, that in of itself is, doesn't create a safe space. So what are the ways we create um, spaces both online and offline and create that for and by us and us setting our own rules, whatever that community needs in order to feel safe. I don't think it is anybody's um, role when you're in, a, um, you're in the privileged community to tell another community what their space can and cannot look like. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if I can just go there. I, I, quite disagree with you on many, many points. I think the idea of safe spaces came up here in the United States as a way of keeping the military out of universities. I think that's where it originated from in the 70s. I understand the need for safe spaces. Uh, I myself, I'm an ex-Muslim and a minority within a minority. Every time I hear the Quran, the, the you know hairs on the back of my neck stands up. It reminds me of executions, of stonings. If I want a safe space, that means I don't want any religious people near me. I don't want to hear religion. And that's just impossible, you know, because other people, while I have a right to my safe space, there are other people who have rights as well. And I think the, the fact of the matter is that we, we do need safe spaces in the sense of we have ex-Muslims who come together to talk about their specific situations. But when we're talking about, you know, public, the public space, uh, then you can't really uh, create those sort of space safe spaces and exclude people. For example, in a university setting, I think universities should be unsafe spaces for ideas that you may not feel comfortable with. I mean, that's the whole point of going to university education. If you don't like to hear any view that makes you uncomfortable, well, maybe you should consider not you know, going somewhere else or, or staying within the confines of your room. 
I mean, I think Salman Rushdie makes a really excellent point when there were calls for the censorship of his book. Well, if you don't like the book, don't read it. But other people may want to read that book. You know, uh, there's been many times when I've been excluded from university campuses. I've been accused of inciting hatred and discrimination against Muslims, where all I'm saying is, excuse me, can we not be killed for being ex-Muslims and leaving Islam? And as a minority within a minority, I have a right to say that. And there are Islamic societies on campuses that are organizing against my being there because it says it violates their safe space. It's, it's being used now as a way of shutting down debate, censoring people, and often censoring people who also have very little power. So it's not about uh, you know, m majority versus minority. And I think that the problem with safe space is it feeds into this bogus identity politics. I think it's completely bogus. Because what identity politics has done is homogenized even minority communities so that you can no longer dissent within those communities because they're homogenized. You can no longer see that there are differences, and it's completely erased politics. There are some white men that I will stand with and some black women that I won't. It's got nothing to do with race alone. It also has to do with people's politics. It has to do with social movements. It has to do with class, class politics as well. And I think the problem with identity politics is that it's made identity so important that it suffocates many people, even within the so-called identity, who don't want to think that way and who want to live and breathe differently. And I think it, it, it has been detrimental to um, to minority communities as well, because if there's something that is unfair, unjust, the way to challenge it is not by censoring it or by silencing it, but by speaking out against it, by fighting against it, by talking against it, by debating, by getting people on your side. You're not going to get rid of racism and fascism and sexism by censoring every fascist, every sexist, every racist. You can't. You know, and that's what I think safe spaces have done. So. Um, I just want to step in here and say it sounds like you're conflating two different things, which a safe space seems to me to be a separate space. For example, this conference might be considered a safe space for secular women, and so at this conference, we wouldn't necessarily invite a Christian minister to talk about how evil atheists are versus criticism in public spaces or racist things said in public spaces. And so I think that there are two different things there that are being conflated. And I, I definitely hear you, what you're saying about public speech, but I question whether, is that, is my understanding of what a safe space is, I mean, is that what you see a safe space as? Well, can we, can we talk a little bit about what, what it means to be, how that word safe is being used in sure. this context? Because yep. I, I, I see the conflation of words uh, as a form of violence, and I can't help yes. but be very disturbed. Because when you put it in that perspective, if words are a form of violence, then violence is an acceptable uh, answer to words that offend you. And so I think we really need to talk about yeah. what, what safety means. I. As a, someone who actually is a university professor and tries to create safe spaces in her classroom, I think there is no such thing as a purely safe space, right? Like, we can acknowledge that. People are going to be offended by all sorts of things, and we can't control it, and we can't really predict what that's going to look like. But as an example uh, of one way that I might try to make a, safe, a space more safe is I teach an LGBTQ issues class. It's like a training ground for how people can learn to be effective counselors with queer communities. And so one of the things that I tell folks when they come to the class is that they might have biases that they have not necessarily worked through. They might come out in ways that they don't expect. But to pause and think before they say something, if they think it might be hurtful to somebody, just you know pause on that. Maybe you don't have to say everything that comes to mind right away. Maybe you can give other people that um, don't normally speak up in class, more of a chance to speak up in class. It's a matter of um, allowing vulnerability and allowing people in class to say, what you just said hurt me and offended me and here's why. Because when you're actually teaching how to work with marginalized populations, I think you need to be able to hear when you've hurt somebody because your words do matter. And especially if you're gonna be a successful professional in other fields, you need to be able to take that without getting defensive and angry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think 
the fact of the matter is that, look, uh, if we're concerned about hurting people's feelings, the, the fact of the matter is that I better not ever speak because a lot of the things I say as an apostate hurts the religious sentiments of many people. So effectively, it homogenizes the so-called Muslim community, if we're looking at it from our perspective. And it says that because people find their religious sensibilities are so important to them, and they're so sensitive about it, that it's better that we don't speak. And that's why we're accused of inciting hatred and discrimination, where all we're saying is, we have a right to criticize religion without being killed for it, without being threatened because of it, and that we also have a right to, 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 to do that. And I think the problem is when you're concerned about offense, it's those that can be the loudest, the most violent, uh, those whose offense is always in your face. I'm offended all the time. I'm offended by Islam, I'm offended by religion, I'm offended by sexism, by fascism, but the offense against me is not of issue here. It's always those who have the most power, the most access, who are the loudest, like the Islamists, for example. And I think in that sense, when you're concerned about offense, because we all end up offending each other, some people are then required to stay silent. And I think one of the things Sarah said that I agree with really strongly is that there's this equation between words and harm. Of course, words hurt. Uh, lots of things that religious people say every day hurt me as well. But I get on with it. And I, I challenge those words with more words. But to equate words with real physical harm, real mental harm, means that there's this ex expectation that those of us who are on the margins, in fact, on the margins of society, are meant to keep silent. And and there's a slippery slope here because when you start saying that X has to be quiet and Y has to be quiet and Z has to be quiet, it, it, it never ends. And that's why you find that the no platforming or the safe space policies, for example, in the United States and also, uh, I'm sorry, in Britain where I live and also I think here as well, is that it starts with the fascists and then anybody goes. You know, it's like feminist comedians like Kate Smirthwaite, I don't know, Peter Tatchell who's this long-term campaigner for gay rights, you know, he's been no platform because someone is offended by him, someone is always offended by somebody else. And so it ends up meaning that it's, you know, it becomes a rubber stamp for censorship. Uh, and I think that's really dangerous. I think we need to challenge bad ideas, we need to challenge racism, we need to challenge fascism. But, you know, the, those before us who challenged uh, these, you know, inhuman belief systems didn't do it didn't progress because they censored it, they progressed because they stood face to face and challenged those ideas with better ideas and persuaded people to join them. And I think that's the way to go rather than censoring things. But when groups are systematically silenced and disenfranchised, I think it becomes very hard when you express, hey, I'm experiencing racism, I'm experiencing sexism, I can't marry who I want to marry. How do you suggest that people actually have their voices heard when every time they speak up, they're being told they're just a crybaby? and they should stop talking. But anybody can answer that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know there's other questions people want. Hey, <laughs> I knew you have a This is the subject of the, the This is the question. We're so going to we talk an hour and a half and we're going to find what's safe. We can just go down this rabbit hole. <laughs> this is the rabbit hole that we've chosen. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, so I think too one of the, you know, so to piggyback on that point, is talking about you know telling people if they're crybabies and in the term and particularly I, I feel like in the last five years people kind of embraced and talked about not only on an individual level but on a group level and societal level is talking about the term of gaslighting right and gaslighting is an, how many of y'all have heard of the gas the term gas so I'm presuming most people in the room have heard of the term gaslighting right mm -hmm. and so we often talk about interpersonal relationships and the ways that that is used as manipulation and abuse right um, particularly we talk about like interpartner violence that's traditionally quote unquote how it's used however there's but more of a discussion about how it is used from privileged communities to tell marginalized communities basically just shut up, right? Your reality isn't your reality. You're being a crybaby. You're being sensitive. And that in and of itself is gaslighting, right? You are telling somebody that their reality is not theirs. Like, that is a sense of arrogance, right? And we talk about that, too, I think, coupled with that, talking about that we live in a patriarchal society, that um, the presentation before, there was talking about things that we value in people, right? The things that we value as far as male and female, and so women are tend to see, be seen as pleasers, and men are, um, you know, the ones that can say what is intelligent and what isn't intelligent and things like that. It's also subscribing to patriarchy, right? And with that, I think it also ties into emotional intelligence, right? And so you're talking about you realizing what you're 
harm is that you can have with somebody um, related to the language that you use and the impact of that. If you don't take accountability for the harm that you have, you're then deflecting and further gaslighting and not dealing with the real emo uh, emotional maturity and the emotional intelligence that's needed to operate in this world. These are all like defensive mechanisms that we do when we're called out on our shit, right? And then we're like, mm, that's not me. That's you. That's your problem, right? And so we talk about, you talk about your class, take a step back. If someone calls you out and be like, you know what? That was fucked up. Maybe it was. <laughs> Maybe it was. Maybe you could have framed it a different way. Maybe you could have said it a different way. Maybe you don't have to attack that person, right? And to not always be on the defense. And I get that's human nature to be defensive in and of itself. But the ways it come out verbally and non-verbally, I think in and of itself can be very harmful and keeps people to remain silent. And I agree with your point. Marginalized communities have to be able to continue to speak up, but we speak up in reaction to the oppression. Just to step in for a second, I think what we what we hear here is a resistance to basically voices that are in power being the ones stepping forward and saying you shouldn't speak and, and defining the rules. Right. They've always defined the rules. But so who I gets to decide what, this? Who gets right. to decide who is in power? Who is a marginalized voice and who isn't? So if you ask uh, many many people that are in educated elite institutions in the United States and in the Western world in general, people like me are not the marginalized group. That they consider me the same as uh, you know a white man that's talking because I happen to be talking against other brown people that have been marginalized in some way. So so this is a complicated issue and it's not as simple as a marginalized voice and a, 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 an empowered voice. And I think that this makes it very confusing. And what happens is that minorities within minorities, like ex-Muslims, just get rolled over, just get ignored, or worse, demonized, consistently demonized. And so when we're talking about you know, who, who is it that we're trying to protect, what is it that we're trying to protect? And in the end, it is only this freedom of speech, it's only being able to discuss these uncomfortable topics that gives the, the people that are at the, at the very bottom some kind of power at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree um, completely with Sarah. I think, you know, I think fundamentally this is a problem that is the result of identity politics, really. Because, um, it, it, because of identity politics, different communities are seen to be homogenous. Uh, they're, you know, and therefore, when you see a community as homogenous, it's usually those in power who decide what the culture of that community is to be. And, and, and therefore, that's how everyone looks at that community. So if we look at the Muslim community, for example, the authentic uh, Muslim is always you know, regressive and Islamist, really. It's, it, it's often equated with someone who's an Islamist, who likes theocracies, who likes the veil, who likes Sharia law, and, and on and on and on. And so because what is considered authentic and what is considered a homogenized community, anyone that speaks outside of that, people like Sarah and myself, we're considered coconuts and you know, Uncle Toms and uh, uh, native informants and yada, yada, yada. And it's just because when an identity is so homogenized, uh, I think it actually does affect those who are most vulnerable within that group. I think the solution to this is that we need to move away from identity politics, really. I think it's hugely detrimental because it is, um, it, I, I think it's, it's oppressive as well in the sense of homogenizing groups and shutting down debate that's needed. I mean, I think if, do we agree that changes in society comes by fighting against oppression? challenging oppression? Or do we agree that we can get rid of fascism, we can get rid of the Islamic State, we can get rid of uh, r racial apartheid in South Africa, we can get rid of uh, you know, um, uh, racism in the United States, uh, merely by uh, censoring fascists and racists and sexists? Is that how it's happened throughout history? That's not how it's happened. It's happened by people who've come forward used their free expression to challenge those who are oppressive. And the only way we have, though especially minorities, the only thing, vulnerable voices, marginalized voices, minority voices, the only thing we have at our disposal is free expression. If that's taken away from us, we have nothing else. We have nothing else. So when you start making conditions and restrictions on free expression, you harm the most vulnerable and, and marginalized in any community. Because you're saying that speech is only acceptable if it doesn't offend, if it doesn't harm, if it doesn't uh, upset me. 
when you do that, you're, you're limiting the space. And we must be pushing open that space if we're going to beat the sexism and racism and oppression that we see in society every day. You know, we're harming ourselves. But I actually, I think there are two different discordant conversations going on here. So I think one of the things that's happening in university settings, and I apologize, I keep going back to this, it's what I function in and what I know best. But when people, people aren't necessarily calling for censorship. I think we're calling for education as to you know the impact that words have. So for example, if you have a professor, to go back to a previous presentation, that says you know everyone in America can be whatever they want if they just work hard enough, and if people say that's a microaggression, I think having a conversation from students that are upset by that as to why that might not feel true, because there is systemic racism and sexism, you can have two equivalent curriculum vitas, and the only thing that's changed is gender or race, and one will get rated down. So it's not that everybody that puts in the same equivalent work is going to get to the same place. So when somebody, a professor, someone in power, says something like that, I think we need to be able to speak up and challenge that and say, what you said was wrong, here's why. Let's have a dialogue about it. So I think what a lot of students on campuses are asking for is for a space to have that conversation. I think it's wrong when people say, that professor said something I don't want, let's fire them. But I think for the most part, that's not happening. And I feel like the news picks up on these very specific instances and then it makes it seem like everybody at university systems just want to censor everything. And on the ground, that's not necessarily the reality. That's definitely the reality. That is definitely the, rea the reality. I mean, I have been barred from universities for inciting hatred. When you say barred, barred, you I've mean been disinvited. I've been banned from universities because of what I have to say. My talks have been cancelled. I've had uh, um, Islamic societies say specifically that my being there would violate their safe spaces. And when I'm speaking about Bangladeshi bloggers being hacked to death in Bangladesh, they're laughing and shouting, safe space, safe space. But is that not their free speech? It's being, of course it's their free speech, but the point is that they are using it to shut down debate. When they say, of course they can come and challenge me, I, I welcome it. I want them to challenge me. The point of the matter is though, they try to cancel my talks, they try to shut down debate. And safe space is being used for that very reason. It's, it's being used to fire people who are not towing the line. It is being used to censor people who are considered outside of the, the norm, who insult, who offend. History has proven that we move forward through offending sometimes very deeply held sensibilities. I think we are the revolutionaries today, fighting against Islam and Islamism. Uh, and, and challenging it, and yet day in and day out we have academics and liberals and people on the left, and I'm on the left myself, telling us not to offend. Can't you change your tone? No, I don't want to change my tone. The only thing I have is my expression. Can you please let me speak the way I want? <laughs> I know you probably want to move on to another no, question, no, but I do want to just really quickly what you're saying. I think what, what you're describing too is, you know, these societies where you are, you're talking about the hate crimes that happen with, within uh, Muslim societies, right? So you are going to speak out as a, a, a press person as leaving the community, right? And what you're, what you're describing to me sounds like those who are in power within this are using that tool against marginalized folks, right? And I think just because that happens, and yeah, that was up that happened to you, right? And that happens to people. When you use a tool that oppressed people are using to say, hey, this is what I need to create space, safe space, whatever we want to call it, then that, that's the problem. Not the problem of the safe space in and of itself. It's the ways in which, like you said, it's applied. So I think those are two different conversations. It doesn't mean get rid of safe spaces because someone's using it in a screwed up way and they're using it against you and to keep you off campus. I think it was like, why are those safe spaces needed in the first place and why are they they're using that tool against you? The point, it's not as, it's not as clear 
as, as who is using it properly and who's using it yeah. improperly. I mean, who's going to be the judge that says this is a, a, a true marginalized community, and when you use safe spaces against them, then you're, doing, you're using it the wrong way. There is no clear standard. Mm -hmm. And that's why it will in, in it just inevitably harm the, the lowest among us, the people that truly have no power. Because who is the one that is deciding what is or isn't a marginalized group? You have to, at some level, have some power at least uh, uh, within the culture, or some influence within culture, to be able to have that voice and that judgment to begin with. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is no one is saying that space, safe spaces have to be rejected and you know, we have to abolish all safe spaces. No one's saying that. Well, OK. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about us here, yeah? What, uh, I'm talking about myself, and I, I think also what Sarah's saying. We're not saying safe spaces should be abolished. We use safe spaces ourselves all the time. We have ex-Muslim meetups. Mm -hmm. We have ex-Muslim events where we come and talk together. And uh, we don't want someone saying, you kafir apostate, you need to die. OK, yeah, we, we understand. We understand the importance of safe spaces. We're not stupid. What we're saying, though, is that in the public space, when you come into the public space, this is not about safe spaces anymore. Universities are not meant to be safe spaces. They are meant to be unsafe spaces for ideas that will challenge you, that will change your being to the core. That's why you go there, to become a different person, to learn about the world, to change your mind, to understand that if you don't agree with something, fight for what you believe in. And maybe they'll persuade you, and maybe you'll persuade them. But the way to persuade and change the world is not by censorship. That is what the oppressor does. That is their tool. Our tool has to be complete freedom, liberation, and that means freedom of expression. A cornerstone of liberation is the right to express yourself in any way, not just by words, but with using your body, using art, using anything at your disposal. That's all we have. And when you start limiting it, you are limiting it for the oppressed, in fact, but using identity politics language, which is bogus, and which I think is, uh, does a great disservice. Sorry, my hair is, I'm getting really <laughs> great disservice <laughs> to, uh, to uh, minority and vulnerable communities. So what I'm hearing is we agree that safe spaces are useful in certain contexts, and that probably we're all against censorship in public spaces. So in well, fact, we I'm all sure. agree I'm about sure. <laughs> those two things. Um, I want to talk about something that's uh, sort of a sub-genre of this discussion, um, trigger warnings, uh, because there's been a lot of conflict about them, and I think they're a great example of how uh, a very specific issue can be talked about in a microcosm of the greater issue. So the University of Chicago released a statement, basically, against trigger warnings in the classroom. and. A trigger warning is just a warning before you talk about something that might be traumatic to people, saying, hey, heads up, we're about to talk about this. And so there's this huge debate about whether trigger warnings function as censorship because, I guess, because they're warning about what you're going to talk about and how they impact these university settings. And so I would like to talk about how you feel as a group, individually, about trigger warnings and how they relate to this greater idea of censorship and safe spaces. Anyone who wants to jump in? Diane. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so for me, for language, I actually use the term content warning. Um, I know that's been in discussion as well, particularly that I'm doing anti-police brutality work. The word trigger in and of itself can be triggering. I get that that can be used and applied in many ways, and people are like, that's too much. When I'm doing work on anti-blackness, and I see, I have seen nothing but black pain on my page, on my Facebook and my Twitter for a week, nonstop from black folks, right? And so, like, trigger warnings or content warnings when I'm about ready to see a video possibly of another, yet another black person being killed, right? Particularly by the police and the way that black pain is used as exploitation and ways to get um, sensationalized in order to get ratings. I 
need trigger warnings for that. I need content warnings for that. I actually have refused personally to um, not watch any of those videos for about the last year and a half, and I'm in the movement. I will read a description about it. I will read analysis. I am not going to watch that because it cripples me, right? It just makes me just hover. I'm like, I can't do this shit anymore, right? And so the part, we talk about like the personal is political, and so in that context, I need content warnings. Now, I have seen content warnings in like some Facebook groups, and you know, I was telling somebody this morning, someone put a content warning. They're like, content warning, I'm going to talk about sex. And then they did dot, 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 and they were talking about like some loud sex, sex session they had, and somebody heard that. I get that. Like that, I was like, okay, that's a bit much. But when we were talking about pain, trauma, and that fact that we live in a society, marginalized folks constantly are living under this trauma, if I can do something to protect my little baby bubble that I am not afforded to have myself, that is something I very much um, want and I appreciate, and particularly, you know, as, as you know, we're always talking about action steps, don't share those videos. Whether you are black or not, I know those videos help uh, mobilize the movement, but time and time again, particularly on um, the last six months, folks are tired of seeing them, right? Um, so that would be my one takeaway is that, you know, if you're gonna share something, put a content warning in it, watch for the thumbnail that you're putting. I know I'm specifically talking about online and we could talk about like, you know, within the classroom and things like that. But for me, that's what I need, that's what I need to do in order to function and be able to get up the next day and not be numb because black people in this country particularly you know forever but particularly this last week have been numb right you get to the point where you can't feel anymore and the ways that manifests internally and the way that manifests within our communities and our interpersonal relationship that is a live reality that we have to discuss um, so prior to going into academia I worked as a sexual assault counselor and I think a lot of uh, trigger warnings and content notices came out of this. So when we talk about kind of priming somebody for the fact that we might be talking about sexual violence or something that actually can be linked to sparking PTSD type symptoms. That being said, I think anything can be triggering. We can never predict what's going to trigger someone. Um, and so there's a certain degree of, you know, I think people will say, well, what's the point if anything can be a trigger? But as an educator, a question that I have to ask is, um, what's the risk of saying, hey, we're about to go into a discussion and there might be a topic of rape that comes up, when you could have people in your classroom that could go into a dissociative state, they could get very upset, and they might leave the room. If you don't say a trigger warning, they might do that anyway when that sensitive subject comes up. At least if you prepare them, for something that's, that could potentially be very upsetting, they have a chance to sit there and say, okay, this might be coming up. Potentially, maybe if they're in therapy, they will have talked about how to handle that. They could do some deep breathing. It just seems like it's a, it's a basic courtesy. I don't really see why it's that big, big of an issue. It literally takes 10 <laughs> seconds to say, hey, this content might emerge. So I don't know why well, there's a big debate over it. I would have liked a trigger warning before this panel discussion because it's annoying me as well. But you know, I, 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 I just really want to roll my eyes, I'm sorry, really badly. Because I, I, I mean, I think that the fact of the matter is, you know, ev we all get have things that upset us. Uh, there are many different things that upset us. You know, black people are in America are not the only ones who have faced oppression. There are lots of people who face oppression. There are white working class people who face oppression. You know, it's it's also it's got to do with race, it's got to do with gender, it's got to do with class, a million other reasons why people face oppression. And the fact of the matter is that we're not talking about your personal Facebook page. You can block anyone you want on your personal Facebook page. It's the same at your home. You don't have to let people come to your home if you don't want them to. But on you, you, mixing up what is personal versus what is supposed to be the public space is a very different issue. You know, at a university setting, for goodness sakes, you know, people are there to hear things that will and might make them uncomfortable. If you start bringing up safe spaces, trigger warnings, this and that and that, there is nothing going to be left of our universities, and that's where we're headed today. The, honestly, universities have become, in my opinion, the most unsafe spaces. I don't feel safe at universities. Y you can't say anything anymore. You can't do anything anymore. You never know if you're going to be banned or not, and for, for the most absurd reasons. It's becoming absurd. 
And if the university is the microcosm of our societies, you can imagine what's happening in our societies. Because at universities, at least, we were able to say everything. We were. I remember that. We used to be able to debate and say anything. And now we can hardly say anything at all. And I think it's just so, so dangerous for us to use these things on the pretext that we're defending minorities. Well, in the long run, when you limit free expression, you hurt minorities the most. And you're doing a service to those in power who love to censor. And they're saying, great, identity politics is doing it for us. So I would, I would say that what Melanie was talking about, just that if a trigger warning was simply just a professor um, talking, uh, saying before class that, oh, that today we might be covering uh, sensitive topics like rape or torture or whatever it is, and just you know steal yourselves or you know if you really feel like the, this would be extremely disturbing, you know talk to me. Uh, I think that would be uh, acceptable to a lot of people. I think if if, if it stopped there, truly. Um, I think w w what makes me uncomfortable is that it's it's less of uh, something that just happens in, the, in that context, but that it is you know inculcating this attitude among students that they have a right not to feel disturbed. They have a right not to feel upset about something, and I think that's when the problem happens. So just to move it away a little bit from from Islam, which I I love to talk about too. <laughs> um, uh, I was reading an article uh, from Jeannie Sook. I think maybe two years ago she wrote an article. She's a Harvard Law professor, and she was talking about the difficulties she now faces in talking about rape law in classrooms. Mm -hmm. And it's become uh, uh, such a, an, an epidemic almost that she feels that, that there, she's talked about how there are dozens of teachers uh, at criminal law in multiple institutions who, who told her that they are not going to include rape law in their courses, and that it's just not worth the risk of the complaints and you know, the discomfort that students report. And so, so now that we're discussing ways that this can impact women and ways that this harms women, when we inculcate this kind of atmosphere, what are we doing in the end? Are we harming women? And I, I totally agree with you on that. I think that we shouldn't be changing and censoring topics that need to be covered in universities. And I think that students also need to understand that part of growth and education is sometimes being uncomfortable. But I also think there's this blanket dismissal of the fact that some topics do actually cause distress for folks, and that repeated exposure to topics can actually make it, can lead to like more dropout rates, can lead to anxiety, can lead to body image issues, substance use. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's a whole field of, of study on this. So I think, you know, I would just like there to be some balance when we, when we have these conversations. So it's not either, oh, they're babies and wah, words, they don't hurt anything at all. And it's not we should censor everything and teachers can't cover topics that need to be covered now. And I feel like this is how the debate gets, gets couched and it's much more nuanced than that. So. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a little bit of a slippery slope, which is like, okay, well, let's talk about trigger warnings in the classroom as, as one thing. And then let's talk about what might be happening as censorship. Because yeah, they might be of the same culture, but they're two totally different things. And so they're, they're different, so they need to be talked about differently. But I also wonder to what extent the fact that there are way more women in school now than there were 30 years ago is part of the reason it's much more difficult to talk about rape law in a classroom because over 50% of your law class is now women instead of just 10 or 15%. So I don't think I don't think you can have this conversation just with without also including the cultural context of the changing dynamics of who goes to university, right? And who's going to law school. You know, that's changed immensely too. Well, with rape law in particular, so it would, to, I don't want to rephrase her entire article, but what Jeannie Sook was talking about was that uh, she necessarily covers uh, instances that are distressing. She doesn't cover the obvious cases where it's clear that the person is guilty and we know exactly how things should go um, in, in a court of law. But in cases where it's, it's very difficult to see uh, who had agency and who was responsible, and this is a, it is an uncomfortable topic. And uh, within her article, she talked about how many, many female students said that they did not feel that they were uh, uh, able to you know, participate in this and there were enough complaints um, to enough uh, professors that they ha have moved away from discussing the issue well, altogether. How are they going to become lawyers? Well, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the question, right? So, that's the question. 
so there's a certain, I, I don't think, um, or at least what I'm not saying, is that words don't hurt or they don't cause um, distress or they don't uh, cause, you know, a variety of ills upon, upon the person. I think they do, and I think that feelings can be valid, but what is up for debate is how we address that hurt and whether or not it is even, uh, it, it, it should even be addressed in a way like trigger warnings, um, and safe spaces, and I'm of the opinion that it isn't helpful in the end, and it's one of those things that we think makes us, well, it makes us feel better, we know that for sure, but does it help us get better along? Does it actually make things better for women? I don't think it does. So I wanted to also address briefly what uh, Soraya was talking about, which was that the, the negative effects of free speech on people and the way that total free speech tends to end up meaning um, majority voices drown out minority voices. Um, and in some ways, you can see this with um, the censorship of, of your voices on campus, right? So when everybody has equal access to free speech, the people who get drowned out are the minorities or the people who have fewer opportunities and fewer supporters. So how do we balance out sort of the reality of what it means to be a minority trying to speak out about an issue when total free speech and total free expression means necessarily that those voices who most need free speech, right? Because I think we're all coming from a place of speech is extremely important and powerful. We're trying to figure out how do we deal with this really powerful tool that we have access to, but that everybody else has access to as well. And when everybody has free for all access, how do we make sure that the people who need to be heard aren't you know, being drowned out with rape threats and death threats, aren't being drowned out with you're a crybaby, go home, aren't being drowned out of showing up at a public university to speak, right? I mean, how, how do we say free speech is really important, but it's also really important to try to hear other voices than the white men in the room? Well, well if you believe in free speech, it, you believe it for everyone. It's not just people you like and people you agree with, and that's the reality. So if you want to have the right to speak unconditionally, you have to defend it for people you don't agree with as well. Uh, it's, it's simple. And, and if you, you decide that some people shouldn't have the right to speak, well, there are lots of people in power who think that you shouldn't have the right to speak. And they're a lot more powerful than you will ever be. And I think the fact of the matter is that if it's a question of freedoms, it belongs to everyone. It's a question of rights, it belongs to everyone. And I think my line is, if there's an incitement to violence, that's very clear. This is no longer about speech, it's about you know, committing violence. Uh, but if it's speech, speech that I despise as well, well, lots of people hate what I say, and I hate what a lot of people say. But I welcome challenging them, because I think my, my, what I say is right. <laughs> That's it, you know, and I'm sure they think what they say is right. Let's fight it out in words. L and let's see how many people will side with me and how many si side with the Islamist. The problem now is that the Islamist is able to speak and we're not because we're Uncle Tom's and coconuts and whatever. What else, what else, you know, native informants. But that's a result of you both being able to speak. You speak, they speak, and the university decides it's a better decision not to invite you. That's a battle of speech, a, and you lost. No, we're not. We're not even allowed to speak. Yeah, we're not even there's, given there's based on your opinion that's already known. So based on the speech that you've already put out into the world, there's speech that disagrees with you, and a decision made no, based no, on those two based opinions. based on who we are because of identity politics. It's based on who we are. It doesn't matter. They don't even know what we're going to say. It's like all those people who wanted to burn Salman Rushdie's book hadn't even read it. It's not. The, they, it's not. They don't even know what you're going to say. How can they even? know what you're going to say when the, they're trying to cancel your talk. The fact of the matter is that be, because of identity politics, ex-Muslim is bad, we are harmful to Muslims, and that's it. And it's not as if the university, is, it, it's not as if all the students are voting for a speaker sure. not to show up. It's some students want a certain speaker to speak, usually at a private event, at their own event, that people don't have to attend. Um, and that event is being shut down, and that is the problem here. We're not, they're not forcing, they're not holding everyone uh, in front of a screen and saying you have to listen to this. That's yeah. usually not what happens. What mm -hmm. happens is that there's a private event, and that private event is unable to happen because there's a lot of pressure to disinvite certain speakers. So that's what we're talking about. I think that's a little bit different. Yeah. 
But my, my question is, and this just happened um, with Milo, Greek name, I'm Greek, I should know how to pronounce it, but I can't. Um, Breitbart, tech guy, everybody knows. So he was um, going to speak, I think, at a Young Republicans event. I mean, I assume he was very much wanted to speak there. Mm -hmm. And a number of students called for him to be disinvited. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't have a, a problem with them calling for that because they were exercising their free speech. They knew who he was. They didn't want him there. They were protesting. I don't think the university necessarily has to respond to them, but they have every right to ask. And so the fact that they would be criticized for asking, like, why is that a, why is it a problem? Well, I think that there's a difference, sorry, between protesting and demanding uh, an event to be shut down. I think you should protest. If a fascist comes on a university campus, uh, you'll be sh you can be sure I'll be there protesting. I'll be there challenging them. If uh, an Islamist comes who wants the death of apostates, I'll be there challenging them. But you know, shutting down debate and calling for censorship, these are two very different things. And I think when we defend the right to free speech, it includes our right to protest. Because, and free expression is not just words, it's different uh, ways of acting, including protesting, having placards. But the point of the matter is that when you call for censorship, it's usually we who suffer. The minority within minorities, the most vulnerable. We are the ones who suffer. And so I think if we are for pro, pro speech and free expression, we need to be pro it unequivocally because eventually we're the ones who are harmed most. And not only because of that, but as a principle. If we defend rights, we need to defend it for people we hate, people we don't like, opinions we don't like. Because that's what rights means. It belongs to everybody. Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're asking is, do we not also have the right to tell other people to shut up, even if they don't listen? I mean, so is that, does that not get included in free speech? Is that something different? Is that like violent speech, telling someone to shut up, is not something that we should allow? Or the problem's really the university actually listening to somebody say, make this person shut up? I think it's a really fuzzy line. So students who pay hundreds of thousands of dollars at times, which is ridiculous, but that's another debate, um, to go to universities then saying, I really wish that some of my tuition fees wouldn't go to support Milo. Um, you know, I, I think on one hand, sure, that seems like they're calling for censorship. On the other hand, there is a blurry line between a consumer and a student, which I have other thoughts on, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of bad thoughts. Um, so I just don't know that it's, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I don't know if it's that clear to me. I, I don't think there is a blurry line. I don't think there is. And I think it's, it's, we do a disservice to ourselves if we think that there is a blurry line. I think, you know, we can oppose speech, we can disagree with it, but to say that someone shouldn't be allowed to speak, because after all, when the Atheist Society invites me, they want to hear me speak. The Islamic society may not want to hear me speak, but those people that have invited me, they're also students on that university campus, and they want to hear me speak. No one is forcing the Islamic society who wants to kill me to come and speak, mm -hmm. or to hear me speak. No one's invited them. Don't come. As Salman Rushdie says, shut the book, don't read it. Mm -hmm. Don't read it, don't come. But there are students within that university who might be sexist pigs who want to hear Milo speak. Well. They're also students at that university. Mm -hmm. if, if I was a feminist and I didn't want to hear him, if I disagreed with him, I would go and raise my voice and challenge him because I think that's where we win. When we challenge the bigots and the racists and the fascists and the Islamists and, and, uh, and all of that, that's where we can win because our ideas are better, better than their ideas. Diane? I had a couple of, sorry many points that came up. So talking about college campuses, I think Melanie bring up a point and now you are kind of speaking to this point. In the space of a university and student fees, right, I think two issues that come up. What is the vetting process that is used in order to bring speakers, right? And so if you're dipping into student fees, like is that even a university policy? Is that something that happens within the student organization? Um, because oftentimes students will get together like we want to bring this person and the advisor will check it off and then they're there, right? So what does that vetting process look like? Is, are they even, are they even um, in existence? The other piece is saying, I don't want my fees to go to support and pay money to this bigot to come on campus. Um, I've 
encounter that, not me being on campus, but somebody that I speak out against, and I'm not going to give them any more attention on this platform, um, their new hustle is going around college campuses and getting money, you know, we often know thousands of dollars, and this person really doesn't have degrees. They say they do, but they all have degrees, right? And so it's like, what is the vetting process for this person even getting on this college campus? Um, I think the other piece, you know, that you were speaking about is that, well, how, they didn't know what I was necessarily going to say. And they might not know verbatim what you're going to say, but based off of our track record, based off of our identity politics, is how we get in the door of the first place, right? Like, we got invited on this panel based off of our identity politics, what our identities are. So I think it's one thing to say, they're not going to, they're not going to, they don't know what I'm going to say, but we're kind of here or we're invited to whatever space we're invited to because of what our identities are and bringing them into those spaces. Well, I hope I wasn't invited because Thank of my identity. You. I hope I was invited because of my ideas. <laughs> um, but I think to, to talk about a little bit about what you were just saying, that there are vetting, uh, you know, hopefully there's some sort of a vetting process with speakers, but that creates the same power dynamic that we're talking about. Then there can be a consensus within uh, student governments and student bodies to say, well, we don't like these, these, these marginalized, uh, these, uh, mm -hmm. these voices. They're just gonna consider them harmful. They're mm -hmm. not gonna think about whether or not they're marginalized. They're just gonna say, we don't like it, and they can shut it down. Mm -hmm. So we have, again, that power dynamic and who decides uh, what the power proper power dynamic is. And I think, Ashley, you were talking about earlier about you know how do we, um, how do we, what was the phrase that you used, that there were minority voices, marginalized voices, how do we bring them to the surface when they're, everybody's equally using their um, freedom of speech? Um, I don't know if there's an answer to that because there is, no, there is no judgment body that can sufficiently find who a marginalized voice is. We have no choice but to give everybody equal due. And I wanna say one other point um, related to before we move on is that, you know, I totally agree with you. If you don't like somebody, show up and protest, right? But we know across this country, protest, particularly marginalized communities, is not something that is seen as okay, that is allowed to do, right? People, there is an uprising go on, going on in Charlotte. People are like, oh, they're violent, because people are valuing property over people, right, at the end of the day. So when protests happen on campus, like what happened in Mizzou, which, you know, spurred all of this protest across the country, people wanted to shut that down, because they're like, well, that's not really free speech you can't have your space on campus you how dare you protest so in theory we say protest is okay but then we look at who can actually protest right and we're looking at particularly black folks protesting we're always told that we're gonna be angry no matter what the hell we do so um, I, I agree with the idea of protest but I don't think even access to who is allowed and who isn't allowed to protest is even equal yeah but uh, I'm not speaking here on behalf of the ruling class I'm speaking on behalf uh, uh, from our perspective as dissenters, as people who are trying to challenge the status quo. And from our perspective, protest is a, a, an important act of resistance. How it's perceived by those in power is a very different matter. Who cares how they perceive it? It's about whether it's allowed, though. It, whether it's saying. allowed, of course. But that's the point of activism, is to push open the space, to make what is impermissible mm -hmm. permissible. 40 years ago in this country, or, you know, uh, not 40 years, but 40 years is the, uh, 60, 70 years ago, the sort of segregation in this country was unheard of. Still you know, is. it still is, I know, but it's different. It's different because there's protest. Protest does change things, not as fast as we want, not as quickly as we want, not as fundamentally as we want. That, that goes back to the system that we live under, where profit takes precedence over human need and human rights. Nonetheless, Protest is what has brought us to the place that we are today. It's never going to be acceptable to those in power because it challenges what they want. It challenges the status quo. That's not the point. The point is that's what we have, freedom of expression. Part of it is protest. When you limit it, you limit it for all of us, for all of us. Please do not limit it for on my behalf. I, I, I don't give you that card to do it. I don't give it to you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a luxury, it's, it's an important right. And a university, I don't care how much you're paying for it, it is an educational center. It's an educational center, it's a place where we have to be able to have the greatest, most radical debates and dissent. That is where, sh that should be the starting place for change in our society, in our world, and our countries. It's become, you know, a, a, a cesspool of identity politics and regression and censorship the exact opposite of what a university is meant to be, the exact opposite.
So. I just, I feel like I have nothing as passionate to add to this. So every time that Miriam speaks, I just feel like I just have to sit here and let everyone just sort of drink it in and then wait for me to just ask more questions. Um, so my, my big question, I guess, is still sort of off of the one that I previously gave, which was like Soraya was up here with numbers talking about how men in spaces basically make those spaces unavailable to women when they participate in them. And so I recognize that this is almost exactly what I just asked you, but like we have to come up with ways to make participating in speech less harmful for women because women get driven out. They get driven out of the movement. They get driven out of online spaces. They get driven out of university spaces. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the answer to that is safe spaces or, or trigger warnings or even that free expression is necessarily the answer or the question. But how do we address the fact that these social norms that are built into the systems that we use that are dominated by the white men who are building these systems, how do we deal with that? How do we even try to deal with that knowing that basically, if, if the answer to limit free expression is not one of the options, what are the options? What is available to us as a tool to address this? Dan, you look like you have something to say. I never have anything to say. No. No one on this panel has anything to say. I don't know if it's like, I want to give space to, I don't know if it's a good time to insert what I want to say. <laughs> so, I just want to jump in. Um, so, because I don't necessarily have an answer or a tool. Um, so my thought on that, though, when I'm so particularly thinking about like the last presentation and talking about like male spaces, I think one thing we have to constantly remind ourselves of is our internalized oppression as marginalized communities. So whether we're women, it doesn't take men to uphold matriarchy. The reason why one of the reasons why patriarchy has continued is because women subscribe to patriarchy, right? And so in these spaces. In these spaces, men let us do the work, they, they let us do the work for them, right? In these spaces, black and brown folks, white folks sit back and watch us do it ourselves, right? To each other, right? And so we're talking, so I think, yeah, this, the system is created, and particularly we're talking about online, that yeah, it's very white male dominated. And so part of it is men calling out men on their shit. I think we kind of know. That. I think the other piece is women holding other women accountable for their shit, right? Like you are a subscribe, we are in a pay, and I think when we're talking about relating it to religion, right? Whether we are not even raised in, in religion, we live in a religious country, society, right? Um, just if we even got out of religion, it doesn't mean we got rid of everything, right? The ways that things are ingrained within us on an everyday basis and how we have to constantly unlearn things, I think that's the everyday thing. So I think one of the big pieces we're talking about, you know, particularly the fact that we live in the US and we always worry about the individual, but we always point outward, right? You, 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 right? But we know the biggest part to change is looking within ourselves. So what are the ways that we are oppressing our own communities? What are the ways that black folks shuck and jive for white people? What are the ways in which women shuck and jive for men, right? What are the ways that queer folk keep other queer people down by subscribing to um, heterosexism, right? Talking about marriage equality and that's all we got, right? And we're good and we can pat ourselves on the back, right? What are the ways that we upholding the systems without those that are in power actually doing it for us? Because that's really where the work we need to do. Yes, we can talk about breaking down white supremacy and patriarchy. We can talk about that. And those, you know, particularly men need to do that and cis folk need to do that work. But what is it we need to do within our in communities? And those are the conversations we don't want to have because it feels like it's airing our dirty laundry. My question, <laughs> which, which maybe have, have, has been forgotten by <laughs> Melanie over here. That's fine. I'm not the most interesting person up here by any means. Um, was how do we deal with the fact that in these free, spa these free expression spaces, particularly looking at the internet where the system is built by, controlled by, has algorithms controlling speech built by white men, how do we address that fact in a way that respects this free expression concept? 
or doesn't. I mean, it doesn't have to respect that free expression concept if you don't want it to. Um, there's something that I want to say that's loosely related, and that is I think when people that are oppressed from any background say that they're being oppressed and they provide evidence that they're being oppressed, your default response if you're a position of power shouldn't be, no, really? Are you sure? What's the evidence? No, no, show me better evidence. No, show me more evidence. Where's the data? Show me the studies that support that. And I feel like that's the, the default reaction that everyone gets when they say they're experienced on something. And I think that people that are in power say that because it's too painful to acknowledge that they might be playing into the system that is oppressive in itself. So that's the one thing that I would ask is potentially um, kind of sparking change is if you feel yourself going into that defensive place when somebody that's oppressed is speaking, just pause for a moment and maybe you don't need to say those words that are coming out. Maybe you can censor yourself a little bit. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I disagree completely. I think, you know, I think they are, um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, just because someone is white doesn't mean that they are an oppressor. There are lots of, lots of oppressed white people, uh, Polish immigrants uh, in uh, Britain, you know, vilified every day who are white, you know, uh, asylum seekers uh, who are white. I think the problem with identity politics is that it homogenizes people, makes all white men bad and all black women or brown women good. And that's not the case. There are lots of brown women who support stoning to death of women who are in the Islamic regime's assembly, for example, who defend, uh, you know, the Borga and, and on and on and on. So I think, first of all, for me, I think it's where people stand, irrespective of their race, their religion, their color, their gender, their sexuality, and on and on and on, where they stand politically for me. And I think fundamentally, if we're looking at how we can challenge sexism in a society, well, you know, it, it's not going to be by censorship and by limiting free expression. We have to look at structural issues, class you know, the, the fact that we live under a system, a capitalist system, that puts profit before human need. And I think, and, and it uses sexism, it uses racism uh, to its benefit, divide and rule. Uh, and, and I think those are the, the things, you, you mentioned class yesterday, we've been talking about it um, at this conference as well. I think those are some of the key ways in which we can fundamentally challenge, uh, you know, sexism at its core, racism at its core. Uh, but again, you know, it, it, it always makes you feel better to, to put band-aids on things because you feel like you're addressing things and, and sometimes not necessarily so. So, so forgive me if this is um, a, a, a stupid question, but you, you keep talking about identity politics, but then also talking about addressing systemic racism and sexism, and I'm a little bit confused about how you can address issues of racism and sexism without also recognizing that there are people who are black and there are people who are lower class and there are people who are women of and um, those how, how you can talk about those identities in a way that isn't identity politics. Do you see the, the fact the point I'm making is that just because someone is white doesn't make them the enemy. Um, you know just because someone is black doesn't necessarily make them your friend. It depends on where they stand. Uh, you can have uh, working class people who are pro-fascist parties, and you can have working class people who are revolutionaries and who join trade union movements and who organize for uh, progressive social change. Just by the very fact that they are working class or that they are black or that they are brown or that they are a minority doesn't necessarily make them uh, heroes. And this is, you know, the fact that we must listen to all, uh, you know, Muslim women. No, I will listen to those who are defending women's rights, who are opposed to the veil, who are opposed to Sharia law. Of course, they have a right to speak. Of course, they have a right to their beliefs. But I will join and ally with people who are fighting for political ideals that I think are progressive. I don't care if they're white. I don't care if they're Richard Dawkins. He's been extremely supportive. Uh, I don't care if Richard Dawkins is a white male. I don't care if uh, you know, there are women uh, uh, who are uh, brown and black but who are standing on the other side of me. For me, my politics matters, political ideals matters. What identity politics has done is just reduce things to culture and identity, homogenized it, and we've forgotten, we've forgotten about political ideals.
Yeah. Sarah, you have I wanted to go back to what Melanie was talking about earlier, which is, and, and then Mariam went um, and spoke about as well, was self-censoring. And um, I was with you up until that point. <laughs> which is to say, I mean, I think we should be, yes, we should be considerate and we should, um, you know, ha uh, ha civil in general, but, you know, we should. But that's uh, what the people ask women to do all the time. Well, we could, we could have a culture yeah. where, you know, let's be polite, let's be considerate, let's, um, you know, it, it, give the other person as much uh, charity when we're discussing their opinions as possible. That's important for political dialogue. But when you get to self-censorship, I think we get into tricky waters. And what it does is sometimes the people that are, the people, the kinds of people who will say, okay, well, I shouldn't say this is maybe rude and I'll shut up, are not the people we want out of the debate. They are the considerate ones who, who think about others and now their voice has just been removed um, from the dialogue, and you think the racist is going to say, oh, I shouldn't say that, let me self-censor. Mm -hmm. No, he's going to talk, and then he's going to be louder than ever before because the considered voices have just been mm -hmm. uh, eliminated from the discourse. So that's <laughs> what I would have to say. I think Diane uh, oh, wanted ahead. to say something. I mean, I don't think it's about, I mean, I, I agree about like, like censoring oneself. I think, for me, the term is more not centering your own damn experience. And so if someone is marginalized saying, my folk are marginalized, we are oppressed, and this is our very lived reality, and this is, if you want to show, it doesn't give a shit half the time when marginalized people do use data, because then people are like, well, I need to show them data for data, right? Like, it's just like, it's just this kind of like reoccurring cycle, like, well, this isn't good enough, and that isn't good enough, and that isn't good enough, and that is, it's like this cycle, right? So we can give data, that's great, but half the time people are like, we don't give a shit about your data, right? Make up your mind. But I think when we're talking about uplifting and honoring the experience of marginalized community. It's about self-censorship, but to me it's also about like centering that person's experience. And when we tell a margin someone who from a marginalized community, hey, you should just you're just being whiny or whatnot, you're making it about yourself. You're making it about what you care about what someone feels about as far as you being in the um, privileged group. And also too, it's it's not binary. It's not that there is all like you said that like, you know, white all white folks aren't bad and all black people aren't good. I don't think any of us are saying that. I think what we're saying is the system of white supremacy, which white folks, whether they want to or not, play into it because we live in a world that was, this country that was built on, um, oh, 10 minutes, okay, that was built on um, and still is, that is dominated by white cis hetero men. You don't, it doesn't, it's not, you know, people want to avoid the R, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, right? It's not about that. It's about the system in which we play into. The fact that the system of itself, that white supremacy in and of itself is, but, is bad, is that we have to talk about the ways in which white people and black and brown people play into that. And so it's not about a label of being a good or a bad person. It's about the system itself in and of itself being oppressive. I mean, for me, I think we shouldn't necessarily have to honor marginalized communities in the sense that I think marginalized communities are not homogeneous, and even the experiences within marginalized communities are different. Yeah. I think we should honor our dissenters, that's where I stand, honor our dissenters whether they are marginalized or not. People who are standing up, people who are pushing boundaries, people who are changing things for the better. And I think that's where politics should come in, and not, uh, you know, what color you are, what your marginalized experience has been or hasn't been, and so on and so forth. Can Questions? Does anyone have questions? It looks like you're all really <laughs> satisfied, <laughs> so we could just end this early. Yeah, thank you for moving to questions. If not, we will just keep sitting here, go back and forth. Be like the teddy this is like ping pong. <laughs> I guess I just feel like we're still having different conversations about what a safe space is, because to me, I just don't think that safe spaces in the classroom as it has been discussed is very useful because the classroom itself is safe because there's a moderator, which is the teacher. You know what I mean? So I've been in, <laughs> hey, okay, hey, I like applauses. <laughs> <laughs> so in my experience in college, like what Melanie said about um, it's a courtesy, I've, I've encountered that. Maybe I'm privileged in that at my universities I've encountered that courtesy from my professors. So it's like, it just kind of floats back. And I've been triggered in a class for something totally unrelated to race and, and class. But I remember sitting there and I had a reaction and then I had an opportunity to process it. So it wasn't even an issue, whether I processed it privately or whether I chose to look over to my 
you know, my classmate beside me or whether I participated in the discussion that took place after the material was presented. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just don't get safe spaces in the classroom as it has been discussed or debated here just yet. Um, and I also feel like I really appreciated what Maryam said about the, pre the pretext of defending the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because in some respects, I don't appreciate someone saying, this might be sensitive to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think it undermines individuals' resiliency and their development as well, because there are plenty of things that offend me to my core mm -hmm. that cause me to physically yeah. shake. And then I'm able to speak about it. Like, I saw you get physically mm -hmm. moved in your seat and allowed you to elaborate and articulate your point mm -hmm. so much clearer because of it. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's something I would hate to do without, and I feel like colleges are one of the only spaces where people are allowed to do that. Finally, I make my own safe spaces. Mm -hmm. When I'm in a group of diverse people, I listen to the different voices, and then if I'm like overwhelmed with the fact that half the people can't understand or relate to my life experience, such is the case with race, <laughs> you know, people just do not understand. If I'm in a room of, of white people, and all that, we have some common ground, but there's certain experiences they just will not understand. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I go hang out with my black friends. Yeah. And I process it after that. And that's my safe space that I've created time for and carved time for in my life. And I don't know what I would do without those spaces, but I'm not trying to insert them into anyone else's. Mm -hmm. I organize them myself. So there's that. <laughs> More of a comment than a question, but welcome nonetheless. I just, sorry. I just had a question for clarification purposes for Miriam because you kept on addressing identity politics. I just, a question about that. If identity politics describes a form of political engagement that highlights issues and perspectives relevant to shared aspects of an identity, and if the term identity is based on cultural context, social history, and lived experiences, then doesn't the term identity politics apply to specific issues highlighted and pursued by feminism, indigenous resistance movements, LGBTQIA activism, as well as ex-Muslim collective, and describes a uh, means of seeking and negotiating increased social power currently not distributed in an equal or just manner. Hmm. Okay. Oh, shall I ask? Yeah, that's, I just oh, wanted okay. clarification on what yeah. you meant by I, identity I mean, politics. For, for me, I think that if I just use the ex-Muslim movement as an example, for me, I don't think the ex-Muslim movement is part of identity politics because it's not uh, saying that you have to listen to us ex-Muslims no matter what. There are lots of ex-Muslims I can't stand politically. I think they're far-right fascists. I think they're anti-Muslim. I think they're bigots. Uh, and their place is with you know, the EDL and Pegida. I would never one day stand with them, even though they're ex-Muslims. So I don't see us as a homogeneous group. I am, um, the ex-Muslim movement I uh, lead is one that's based on politics, the politics of challenging Islamism, challenging blasphemy and apostasy laws, and also saying that ex-Muslims deserve the right to be treated well and fairly within their families and larger communities irrespective of whether they decide to stay in Islam or not. So I think that's, for me, uh, if, if it was just about identity politics, it's about, you know, if you, you have to listen to X, Y, and Z because we're ex-Muslims, it doesn't matter what the hell we're saying. And that's my point. You know, just because you're a woman, I'm not gonna say you're a feminist or I'm gonna agree with you just because you're a woman, just because you're black, just because you're ex-Muslim. What are you saying? Where do you stand? then I'll stand with you. If that politics is progressive, if, it's, if it challenges the status quo, if it does something that changes uh, uh, people's lives for the better, I'm not just gonna side with you because you're black, because you're ex-Muslim, because you're so and so, and I'm not just gonna hate you because you're white. No, I have a lot of allies who are white, a lot of allies who are men, and a lot of enemies who are on the left, even though I'm a communist myself, and who are uh, you know, uh, they consider themselves progressive. I think, you know, we don't stand in the same place. So for me, it's about political ideals, and that's how it's been throughout history. Every movement that has brought change in the world today, whether it's the anti-apartheid movement, the anti-war movement, the, the nuclear disarmament movements, and so on and so forth, they have all been centered not around, we are all white men working together, we are all ex-Muslims, we are all black men, no. It was people working towards political ideals, black, white, gay, straight, so on and so forth. And that's what I think progressive politics is. And what identity politics has done has destroyed that. 
And that's why today, when we're dealing with ISIS, we're dealing with the Islamic Republic of Iran, we're dealing with free thinkers being hung in city squares across the Middle East and North Africa, there are progressives in this country who say we don't want to offend the Muslims. Thank you. Thank you, um, all of you, for coming and, and your ideas, and it was great to hear from all of you. Um, just a quick brief on the, on the trauma and content warnings. One of the things that I didn't hear mentioned was that in the classroom, there is a power differential, and often classes, students have to be there, right? It's mandatory. They can't walk away. So I think just as a, as a common sense sensitive sensitivity issue, it's not a bad idea, and it certainly can't hurt the space of dialogue. Um, but that's not actually my question. My question is, so we have First Amendment rights for free, free, uh, free speech. So how do you balance that with the Second Amendment rights? For instance, in Texas now, you can have concealed ca carry on my alma mater and some of the other four-year universities. So now you have a potential for limiting the willingness, and that's what a lot of faculty have been told, just don't talk about sensitive issues. So this is something I'd like to hear you know, from anybody there. That's a whole other panel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not bad. The I'm Second like, Amendment panel. We'll That's the after party after a couple drinks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be tonight well, after many drinks. I can address it to the yes. extent that um, violence, political violence, um, is it, it's one of those vetoes that you really can't get over. And it's something we saw with uh, Charlie Hebdo, where uh, it doesn't matter what, what everybody else thought. There were a few people who said, who said, hey, this is my veto. I'm going to take away your life. And this has uh, catastrophic effects on our discourse. And what was worse was that after those shootings, there were too many people on the left, too many progressives, who said, well, you know, but their cartoons were like, uh, were a little racist, were a little bigoted. But, you know, it's irrelevant in the context of that. And we need to all be defensive of those people. Uh, so thank you so much. I. Uh... I must confess, I was hoping that you would resolve this for me because uh, I am I am a university administrator, but I actually you know have benefited personally from other people offending me in the classroom. I think it was probably the instrument that led me to uh, uncouple myself from my my family's religion and my previous religion. So. Um, yeah, but uh, speaking of being an administrator, I, I've been working in student services for a while to the point where I've seen the introduction of safe spaces, we call them safe zones actually. <laughs> and uh, we define them at, when I worked at the new school in Manhattan as uh, spaces free of um, unfair treatment or discrimination. So I think it came out of, as administrators, we saw an epidemic of students uh, suffering uh, bullying uh, in the residence halls specifically, so I worked in housing for a while, and they would be abusing substances, hurting themselves, etc. And I think uh, as, as, as administrators, we realize that we've been failing students um, in terms of giving them structures to deal with conflict. Um, we, threw, we threw them into this you know, diverse mix and we didn't tell them mm -hmm. how, how to deal with it. And so um, I guess I'm going to try not to go on too long, but I'm wondering if the problem happened when these safe zones that we tried to create, which did start in the dorms in my experience, in the residence halls, started seeping into the classrooms and that's where the conflict began. And I don't think we can say that a university is a public space anymore because you know, students do see it as home, but it shouldn't be, it is public when it's a classroom, and it is public when it's a uh, public event. And so, uh, I guess my question is, is it really a zero-sum game? I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding the slippery slope argument of, uh, you know, if we allow them a little bit, does it take over and shut down all conversation? And I'm just gonna leave you with one thing, and, and Melanie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I had a meeting recently with the associate provost, one of the associate provosts at Columbia, and he was talking about how there's a statue with a woman with her hands out, uh, and she's got a little owl in the folds of her dress, I don't know if you've seen it. And basically it's the woman nurturing wisdom, right? And he, he talked about putting heart back into the university administration. And he wasn't talking academically, he was talking about us, the people who support the students. And I think that 
you know, is that possible too? Can we have safe spaces and can we have a fence? And maybe, you know, it benefited me, but I can see how it's hurt other people. So maybe we can have a more nuanced uh, point of view. Thank you. sort of going to be, actually she, she pretty much took most of what I was going to say, but I wanted to ask, I guess, like, so, so maybe, maybe the, the question that Jasmine wanted you guys to sort of have an answer to, um, mostly to uh, Miriam and Sarah, if you, if you have uh, more thoughts on this. So yeah, as Jasmine said, like, there's a concept of the university as a whole as a safe space, which I think we agree the university as a whole is not, you know, a safe space, but there might be safe spaces within a university and things like dormitories or certain student groups or certain other activities where, you know, people, people are living their everyday lives and I'm wondering um, if you two in particular would draw a line and say, you know, in dormitories there shouldn't be this certain type of speech because people have to live here. Or are you, would you say, you know, the, the university as a bastion of free expression should extend to these areas of more, you know, student life and not just the academic classroom setting? Mm -hmm. You people are really asking hard questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if I can just comment, or Sarah, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, okay. are you sure? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, um, you know, the question also originally you, you had asked, um, I mean, I think it is, for me, I think it is a slippery slope. Once you start censoring and limiting what can be said, you do end up with no end in sight. And I think we're not talking hypothetically. You can see that at universities in Britain, for example, where I have experience with. I mean, you have wonderful people, people who are really fighters for gay rights, women's rights, being kept out now. You know, Kate Smirthworth, who is a well-known feminist in Britain, you know, she uh, defends the Nordic version of uh, law regarding um, uh, sex workers, where uh, the man is, um, the punter, whatever it's called, is uh, prosecuted but not the sex worker. And because uh, some in the feminist society, I mean the feminist society voted 70% to 30% to let her come and speak, nonetheless that 30% said she's horophobic and she cannot speak and they uh, cancelled her talk. So what I'm saying, it is a slippery slope, or Peter Tatchell who is this wonderful campaigner. He used to be called a terrorist by the British state, and now he's become a national treasure just because he's done it for so long. You know, they've had to give up and say, "All right, let's call him a national treasure. Maybe he'll leave us alone." <laughs> you know, he he has signed um, a, a letter in support of Julie Bindel, who uh, uh, says that trans uh, uh, trans women are not really women. You know, and I disagree with her position, and Peter Tatchell disagrees with her position, but he said that she has a right to speak, and that she has you know, 40 years of feminist uh, work behind her, uh, you know, and she's been barred because they call her transphobic, and I might agree with that, you know, but what I'm saying, that that's the problem with the slippery slope. You know, and uh, on the point that you were raising, I mean, I think you know, the point is not that I, I now have to listen to an Islamist in my toilet and in my bedroom, you know, obviously, you know, but the point is that when it is the public space, and I think meeting rooms, events, public events, and even to an extent the classroom is a public space, there is, that should be unsafe for all forms of debate. Uh, but, you know, if you want to stop bullying, if you want to stop um, uh, sorts of real issues that students face, you're not going to st uh, stop it by censoring speech. I mean, we deal with ex-Muslims all the time who are being threatened by their families, who are self-harming, who are committing suicide. You know, I'm, I'm, we're not going to stop that by saying that no Muslim should ever be allowed to speak again. That would be absurd. It's, it's putting a band-aid, it makes you feel better that you're silencing people you disagree with because then it makes you feel like you're actually doing something but you're not because if you want to make the lives of ex-Muslims better, you've got to challenge those Muslims who are saying that we should be killed and stand alongside the many Muslims, uh, like my, my own family, who say that they shouldn't. You know? And that takes political work, it takes uh, you know, organizing work, it means you have to speak, 
Um, and therefore, speaking and expression is so important, in fact, to protect those who are being bullied and who are marginalized. Thank you. I cannot agree more. I cannot agree more. And uh, uh, I come from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I think those who were uh, able to make an impact uh, were those who were OK with unsafe places. Uh, because uh, it's uh, unsafe in Saudi Arabia anyway to talk. And uh, only if you speak up and that when you make a uh, change. We don't even have a, a, a healthy public sphere where, where we can uh, uh, discuss a normal political issue, let alone a safe place. Uh, so I think in general, uh, a safe place could be a utopian concept. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, especially in some parts of the world. Uh, so we have to be safe, I mean, okay with unsafe places if we wanted to make a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we uh, think a safe uh, place is a precondition for uh, free expression, then we are tremendously uh, limiting the free expression. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Hello? Okay. So uh, there's been a lot of talk tonight about uh, talking past each other and how uh, sort of both sides are kind of tackling different issues of safe spaces in either a private sense or a public sense. So I was wondering, time permitting, if I could hear from each of you what you think the primary disagreement is on this issue. I actually don't think that we are talking about two different things. I know several speakers said that, that we're talking about two different things. I think maybe we, maybe I haven't done the best job in showing how one relates to the other, but I do think that they are uh, in vain and in, in, the same, in the same line. Um, when we're talking about uh, creating uh, safe spaces, when we're talking about uh, certain ideas that can be so traumatic to somebody, we are um, legitimizing uh, the idea that uh, some ideas are just too sensitive to talk about, some ideas are not that sensitive to talk about. Mariam has talked, um, uh, she has touched on identity politics quite, quite a bit. And to the extent that um, I agree with what, what she's saying is that, uh, uh, quite often, and someone else, um, I think it was your comment where you talked mm. about this, where you said that, you know, these are, it's just presented as, this may be offensive to Muslims, right? So if you're going to say, okay, this is an Ayan Hirsi Ali talk, it may be offensive to, to Muslims, you are uh, defining what, what it means to be Muslim. You are, mm -hmm. you know, creating a, you know, this is what m Muslims feel, this is what many Muslims feel, um, and therefore you're making it very difficult for reformers and for people who are on the margins to speak out. So I think that um, they are related. I hope that we sort of touched on it a little bit, but I think that can do more work. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi. I, I, I agree with Sarah. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> my, my only um, lingering thought is I, I do think there's a need for some identity groups to band together, to fight together. So I think when we talk about how you can't say it's all one group against another, I mean, I agree. There are different subgroups and different needs within populations. But for example, Black Lives Matter, clearly police brutality and police oppression is targeting disproportionately one group. So to say that that community shouldn't connect and bond over these experiences and push back, same with the queer community and systematic heterosexism, I think is ignoring a reality that identity groups do share needs and do have some shared struggles. So that's where I think there continues to be a disconnect over the value of identity politics at times. <laughs> 